because we have another European chat uh, which will be dedicated to the topic of digitalization. So uh, I will now ask uh, our organizational team to set up the scene again. Uh, but please stay in this room. Uh, there is no uh, there is no break. Uh, we will we will continue with the program as soon as possible. Uh, in next uh, minutes, we will discuss the topic of digitalization as a driver for growth in Europe.
Good afternoon again. Uh, as I promised, uh, we didn't have any break and we are moving on with another discussion this time focused on the digitalization as a driver for growth in Europe. Uh, this panel is organized in cooperation with the European Investment Bank and uh, we will discuss uh, about the digital share of economy and uh, the, um, let's say, the challenges and opportunities that are linked with the digitalization and how digital world can help us to to uh, to launch the economic growth again. Uh, I'm very happy that I can pass the floor to the moderator of this event, uh, Teresa Vilobai, who is from the Czech uh, television, and I would like to, to pass the floor to you. And I would also like to invite the speakers to go here on the stage and to take the take the seat so we can start with the discussion. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the European chat. Um, uh, thank you for joining us here. And uh, first of all, let's give a warm welcome to our guests. Please welcome uh, Mrs. Desiree Rückert, an economist from the European Investment Bank, and Mr. Mikulaj Peksa uh, from the European Pirate Party. Uh, he's a member of the European Parliament. Thanks a lot for being here with us. Uh, let's do it the way um, that first we will debate the important topics uh, together and then there will be a lot of time for the Q&A with the audience. Uh, please, uh, to ask speakers questions, uh, go to www.slido and enter the event code uh, to join the conversation. I will see your questions here and I will ask them then to our great speakers. The whole chat will be 40 minutes, but I guess you know all of that. Uh, we are in the middle of the digital transformation uh, of Europe. The digital share of the economy is growing rapidly and data has become a very valuable commodity. How can the EU make the most of the situation? The question for our speakers. This is Mrs. Rickert. Yes, so um, thank you very much for giving me the floor here. Um, so I think most of my responses I will base on, on a survey that the European Investment Bank is r running every year with 13,000 firms in the EU as well as in the US. So we cover all European member states as well as firms in the US, which gives us a good good comparison. And I think what we what we see in this survey, where we capture as well whether firms do use advanced digital technologies and how they reacted uh, to the COVID pandemic, is, is showing that digitalization is extremely important for firms. If you compare productivity performances of firms that do use these very advanced technologies compared to firms that do not, you see productivity gaps that are quite uh, substantial. Um, and that goes well beyond just productivity. It goes as well into how much are these firms paying their employees? How often do they train their employees? Um, and, and how big is the market for these companies? So, so I think yes, digitalization is, is, um, is really a, a very important topic to, to be discussed here. Do you have something to add, Mr. Pixa? I guess there's plenty. <laughs> That's for the beginning. Does it work? I hope so. Okay. Yeah, uh, I hope so. I mean, like, uh, definitely, this is a very important topic. Uh, what to continue? I mean, like, uh, our world has changed in this in the way that uh, the digital has become probably the most important, let's say, sector of uh, of the production. It affects horizontally all the all the others, uh, and uh, the data and the, the the way how the processes uh, are being organized by means of uh, digital uh, digital uh, tools have become crucial for uh, competitiveness uh, in all, all the respective fields. Under such circumstances, it is absolutely crucial uh, to have a common European digital market because, I mean, uh, the way how IT sector works is very much dependent of uh, capacity to, let's say, reuse uh, the same uh, the, the, the tools to uh, share the data, to, to use them, to process them. 
I mean, where do we see a uh, huge, uh, let's say, uh, lacking of uh, Europe as it is right now? Uh, it's exactly because of uh, we have not been able to really have fully uh, common European digital market in the sense that it would be possible to uh, share and to cooperate across Europe uh, without any like uh, useless boundaries. So we have a lot of like uh, cases of geo-blocking. We have a lacking interoperability. We uh, do lack a com uh, common identity to use the IT systems. Those are all the issues which uh, creates a very fragmented market. And I mean, like for digital companies, the p opportunity to scale up, to grow, it's uh, very important. I mean, like that's what what uh, makes the difference. And then the uh, the other big players, I mean, like the U.S. and the China, they are they are really like over uh, overrunning us. So I mean, uh, this uh, regulatory cooperation is something I see as the most vital in order to achieve uh, prosperity in the 21st century. Mrs. Schuckert, I uh, read an article you wrote like two years ago with your colleagues uh, when uh, you were saying uh, that uh, the EU, um, the EU uh, lag behind the US uh, in the development, if the, uh, in the development of technologies, uh, including digitalization. Um, are we catching up now? <laughs> So yes, so what we did is we, we looked at, at patent data, right? So that is a proxy for um, like where, where is innovation and right now in which fields are we innovating and we can compare different regions, right? And so if you look at the speed of digital patents, there has been massive growth. So you, you see that this is getting more and more important and there Europe is lagging definitely. So um, if you look into the shares of patents that go into the direction of digital, then, then yes, the US as well as China are well ahead of the EU. Um, and just last year, um, I mean, th these are the big players, right? And that last year we were teaming up with the European Patent Office where we looked into small companies and medium-sized companies that hold patents in digitalization. Um, and we compared those in the EU and in the US. And there again, we see that not only do we have fewer of these small companies that pa patent in, the, in these advanced digital technologies, but very often the very successful ones um, tell us that their future market they see in the US. And I think that is, is very worrisome. And I think that's what you have been highlighting as well already. So what is, I think, from European perspective, maybe a, a more positive view is if you look at the intersection of digital and green, or if you look at the intersection of digitalization and automotive, there Europe is still a very, very strong, uh, in a very strong position. And I think we need to take very much care of that, that it stays that way. So what can we do? Uh, how can uh, the EU achieve uh, the leading position in the digital market? Mr. Pixar. Uh, I would maybe at this point a little bit comment on what my uh, <laughs> colleague uh, spoke about. I mean, uh, I'm not really sure whether patents are actually a good measure for uh, innovations because patents itself are actually uh, hindering the innovations and preventing the other people from using them. So uh, should we be trying to uh, to, to boost our capacity to innovate, I would probably or I would preferably go for in uh, allowing uh, sharing or reusing the existing solutions in order to develop it and uh, further further progress. I mean the the existing uh, landscape of very fragmented uh, fragmented uh, patent uh, patent covered uh, field is actually the, the thing that is uh, currently hindering us. I mean, like it, it's maybe not only about patents, it's also very much about licenses and uh, other uh, other uh, products of that type. But should we be really willing to, to expand faster? I think we should definitely get rid of those obstacles. And I mean, like uh, on the European level for sure, because that's what prevents us from moving for, uh, farther on in Europe, uh, but generally also in the global scale, because that prevents Europe from expanding uh, overseas. What do you think about it? I mean, just uh, as a response to that, I, I think, I mean, I don't want to defend nor patents per se, right? But I think for us as economists, it's a very important proxy to see where we do stand, right? And I mean, if we look at the largest firms when it comes to market capitalization, I mean, these are full of digital companies that are not based in the EU, right? So, and I think, I mean, there we, we need to do somehow, I mean, 
when it when it comes to digitalization, Europe needs to to think about uh, w what to do to catch up, right? I mean, w not only if you look at innovation, but if you look at the adoption of those digital technologies, we ask companies, right? Do you make use of big data? Um, and and there you see that there are differences on on both sides of the Atlantic. So in the U.S., you still have more firms telling us that they use that. If it comes to digitalization overall, Europe seems to be catching up. So when we first asked this question four years ago, the difference between the EU and the US was more than 10 percentage points, and this is really narrowing over time. So it seems that European firms do see the potential, and I think the pandemic probably played a huge role in this, um, that these advanced technologies do help them. Um, and I think what what still is lagging is, is particular that, that small firms do face obstacles there. And I think there Europe really needs to, to pay attention to, to make sure that we don't lose those small firms in, in certain regions. It's even worse than in others. So I think there um, a lot of focus need to be put on. You are making a very interesting point because there is also the thing that um, the different parts of the EU, EU have a different level of the adoption of technologies of digitalization. Uh, do you see that as a big problem? So yes, again, if I can just use use survey examples, right? And then we see that there is huge variety in European countries, uh, whether firms do use certain technologies, but it's not always as you would expect it. So, I mean, for sure you have uh, Finnish and Swedish firms much ahead, but um, but then you see as well that there are some, some, some Central and Eastern European countries that are doing quite well in this respect, uh, whereas some Western countries such as France are not doing as great. So, um, so there's a huge variety, but you'd for sure see as well um, regional variation. And typically, firms in advanced regions are as well advanced in digitalization, and the firms in less developed regions are, are lagging behind. And that's, uh, of course, a worry because, um, yes, you need to, to help them to get out of this uh, position, and particularly small firms. So there's a huge gap in this adoption between large corporates and, and the very small ones. How can the emergence of a new multi-speed EU be avoided, let's say, Mr. Pixon? Uh, well, uh, mainly, uh, I would say, through two approaches. Uh, first of all, we need, uh, we need a clear regulatory framework uh, in order to prevent this multi-speed uh, multi Europe to, to be created, uh, which definitely requires the European Union, namely the European Commission, and also all the other institutions that are kind of responsible for creating the regulatory framework, that means the Parliament and the Council of the Member States, to really work on and to deliver on the solutions uh, before we face uh, the situation that the member states will take their initiative and uh, will resolve it on their own. I mean, like uh, in, in many fields, we have been, uh, we have observed that the member states implemented some solutions uh, independently of each other and then we have realized, okay, we have quite like fragmented like landscape and we should have thought about it before. Uh, that's one part of the story. What I think is also uh, done but could be done better would be the investment part I mean like European Union shall really have uh, better investment politics now I'm a little bit talking about the European investment banks of course there are always like um, demands to let's say increase uh, spending on digital increase the uh, spending on the on the green transition uh, well then if you are uh, if you look into the way how the uh, European money are actually being spent uh, this it's quite often like uh, lagging be behind uh, behind uh, uh, goals. I mean, like uh, I have not in my hand just uh, uh, numbers for for digitization, but should I talk about like uh, greening of the economy? I think uh, in the previous multiannual financial framework there was uh, 21 percent, uh, 20 percent requested. Nominally, the European Commission claims 21 percent was uh, reached. However, in practice, the European Court of Auditor says, oh, it's just 13. Yeah, and that's that's the greening. I guess the digital will be very, very same. So we really need to, to make sure that the money we do uh, dedicate for the investments into the digital field or any other field are really properly spent. Do you have something to add? I, I, I think yeah, one, one point I think that is of really high importance there is um, if you look at the digital infrastructure in place, th this does play a huge role, right? I mean, we observed that internet speeds are 
com are not comparable all over Europe. So you have some regions that have excellent access to internet, whereas others don't. And I think that's a very first step, right? To make sure that companies that settle down in regions that, that they have access to the best infrastructure. So, I mean, it, it, we, we can show that in the data, right? The better the internet speed, the, the more likely it is that firms actually do become more digital. And I'm, I'm pretty sure the same would hold through for looking at, at households, right? I mean, I think that that's, I think, a point that really needs to to be made. So digital infrastructure, I guess, is, is crucial in, um, in getting Europe uh, on speed. Uh, we went uh, through a period when we were all using uh, online space more in general, the pandemic. Uh, would you agree with the, the idea that the pandemic um, kind of speed up the process, the digitalization? Mr. Pixa. Uh, yes, very much true. I mean, like uh, before the pandemic, I think a uh, lot of people were not even able to imagine that uh, some some processes could be run digitally. I mean, like. I always, always love to remind the case of Pirate Party because we have been digitized since the very beginning. We have decided, uh, like, had all our decision-making processes organized online. So when the COVID started, uh, it was quite easy to do the general assembly to elect uh, uh, people in the board and so on. Uh, I just compared with the local communist party in Czechia. Uh, who faced the situation that they are supposed to replace their board with someone else, but they were not even able to organize the general assembly because they had absolutely no online tools to, to do this stuff. So the party, in my, uh, according to my information, was blocked for like half a year because they were simply not able to, to, to process what was needed. This is, these are political parties, but it was also companies. Well, uh, the European Parliament itself had to learn how to do online voting uh, and how to, how to ensure that, uh, that it works. So I think it helped a lot, and uh, the the pandemic actually uh, fastened all the processes in in all the fields. I would say even by, by twenty years compared to what we would uh, encounter without without the pandemic. And now all the all the stuff like uh, home offices, everything has become so normal, so common that uh, yeah. I think we in Czech say that everything bad is for uh, for uh, also for some things good. So this this was the case. But we are happy that we can see each other face to face right now. Uh, did uh, something really innovative come from uh, that period, or we just uh, somehow learn how to use the things we already knew? No, I don't think so. So I guess, I mean, if, if you look at, at as well, again, the firm responses, right? I mean, they are telling us that um, they, are, they are working differently today than they have been three years ago, right? So I, I guess um, if you look into how to organize your business, and, and it's not just working from home, I guess... Uh, a lot of aspects have been changed. And I guess if it com comes to innovation, I guess um, companies as well are, are getting much more aware of um, what is possible with digitalization. I'm sure that the outcome of this will be seen uh, in the coming years. Um, and I guess, yes, I mean, big data and the like will play important roles in, in innovation. And I think if you look at the vaccine developments, I guess uh, with, without um, digital solutions at hand to exclude certain certain routes to take in, in research, I guess we wouldn't have had um, these vaccines this quickly available. So I guess, yes, I'm, I'm sure there will be more, more to come um, very soon. I can see here on my tablet that nobody's asking, so feel free and ask if you want to ask something, our great speakers, we will continue now. Uh, the, Digital age offers great opportunities, uh, but also a big risk, let's say. Is the European legislation strong enough or prepared enough for all these changes, Mr. Pixon? Uh, well, uh, actually, this is very actual uh, topic because I mean, like, uh, especially when we are talking about what was happening uh, in the previous two days in the plenary of the European Parliament, we have been approving a uh, couple of uh, important pieces of legislation that uh, touches uh, cyber security. Um, I mean, like, uh, I was personally uh, somehow involved in the Digital Operational Resilience Act, which is a piece of legislation that improves cyber security in the financial sector. So, I mean, like, Speaking very very much practically, so far there was not really like a system that would that would warn uh, people. Should you have like for example, bank in Czechia, bank in Slovakia, bank in Poland, bank in Germany, attacked all by the same hacker, 
there was no one really to spot there is a like orchestrated attack against European banks. We should report that and we should we should we should solve it. And it's endangering not only like the security of the data, but generally like uh, increasing the risk in the financial sector. So I mean, like so far this was not done. Now we are in the in the phase of like uh, strongly strengthening the whole cybersecurity network. So I think uh, we are catching up, but it's definitely it's definitely like uh, five minutes after the twelve, so to say. You are um, supporting, as the member of uh, European Parliament, um, the digitalization, but also, for example, the development of artificial intelligence in Europe. Uh, are there any ethical limits in the prospect uh, we should not cross in any situation? Well, I think uh, when developing the artificial intelligence, we shall definitely always keep in mind the fundamental rights and uh, keep the fundamental rights uh, approach. I mean, uh, this is not easy easy task because the artificial intelligence may sound as a general buzzword, but in fact, uh, those are very diverse technologies affecting very different fields. What I think they have in common, they should have like a proper human rights or fundamental rights assessment for whenever it is, uh, whenever it is. I mean, uh, the, the the outcome of such an assessment could be quite different for an insurance company that is evaluating capacities of their uh, of their clients uh, compared to whatever uh, what would you expect from a self-propelled car uh, that is being uh, that, that is being operated by the artificial intelligence. In all cases. Uh, the, the, the process could be similar, uh, different, the technology could be different, but we should always have to check whether this is aligned with the fundamental rights. So for sure that that is something uh, which is needed. And uh, but maybe one, one more point, when it comes to the development of the, the artificial intelligence, it is very much a question of uh, data, of the data sets that are being used in order to uh, in order to train the artificial intelligence for uh, for uh, making its decision the data sets their availability i mean like um, uh, the, the availability in the sense that they are not being held just by a particular company but if they are being produced by the public uh, administration they should be available to everybody to foster the development, uh, it's something very important. I mean, like we should strive for open data in general. We should also be careful about, and now I'm coming again back to the to the uh, problem of fundamental rights violation. We should be careful about what is in the data set. If you train a data set uh, to, uh, or like uh, an artificial intelligence of uh, on the data set, which is for some reason, I, I would say a racial biased when you are, for, for example, analyzing human faces, you will encounter a, an artificial intelligence which is inherently racist. That's natural. I mean, like it's a neural network, so you can train it that way. So you should be careful about what you are feeding into that automata uh, for, for uh, making their minds. What is your point of view? No, I don't think I, I, I can add much to that. I, I think, yes, um, I think, um, I mean, these technologies are developed. So, I mean, Europe needs to, as you say, I mean, if there is enough data as well available where companies in Europe can train their data sets on, I guess that that's it's highly important. I mean, it's, I think what would be worrisome is if these data sets, these big ones are just in the hand of a few global players and then Europe is, is excluded from that, right? I mean, we we do observe that, I mean, if, if you look at those companies that are most productive, that are fully digital, and then you would ask them, like, do you expect more competition, yes or no? I mean, those are telling us no, right? And I think that is a bit worrisome. So I guess what needs to be made sure is that um, that European firms do have access to, to these data sets as well and, and um, make sure that um, they can train um, their uh, algorithms on this as well. So yeah, I don't think I can add much. In uh, recent years, the large online platforms that dominate the market took the role of, um, let's say, online gatekeepers. At the same time, the business models are built around obtaining data from their users. Uh, do they give users adequate control over their data? Over their data? Mr. Pixel. 
Well, this was a question that was raised uh, in the last years, and the result of this uh, questioning is the so-called Digital Market Act. Because the Digital Market Act is exactly the piece of legislation that is supposed to regulate those gatekeepers, the, those owners of huge chunks of data uh, that effectively control the market. Whether it was successful or not, I would say Yes, we have Digital Market Act. Uh, it could be better, for sure, for sure. And uh, I, I believe we will we will need uh, to reiterate the discussion in some years uh, again, because uh, those gatekeepers are really like important players in the field, and we need to uh, we need to strike a balance. And I mean, I mean, like uh, this is something absolutely new, absolutely uh, like crucial and probably comparable one uh, to, uh, to to the situation when, for example, like the TV was introduced and people have started talking, well, maybe there should be some supervisory board uh, over the public broadcasting. <laughs> So this is this is a very similar thing what we have done in the Digital Market Act. It was approved uh, in the trialogue, if I'm not mistaken, in uh, bef uh, like two months ago, something like that, and it will it shall go into tact uh, during the next year. Are interventions made with um, an understanding the specific situation of, or are they too general? It's hard to say, I know, but, but what more can we do in this respect? I guess um, what, what is important if, is um, like when we ask companies, right, um, what are obstacles for you to invest? Um, and, and we do ask them as well about regulation. You, you do see that, I guess, what would help companies to, to go forward is, is that there's uh, some, some sort of consistency and some sort of, uh, that they are aware of what will, will be coming, right? And I guess, again, um, probably the small ones need to have bigger support in, in how to implement those uh, than, 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 than the larger ones. But I think, yeah, I mean, um, I guess it, it's a difficult task to set up these regulations. Um, and I, 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 I just think that what, what is important is just to, to make sure that um, th this is done in a way that uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises are supported. And, and it, it's not just regulation that would hamper them to, to catch this drain of digitalization. I still don't see any questions. So just I want to remind you, feel free if you want to ask something. I hope this is working well. but. Nothing. Uh, so let's continue. Um, all that we are speaking about, um, does that have to be a political decision? Uh, how much of freedom can we sacrifice for our security, let's say, in general? I will generally do not take the approach of sacrificing freedom uh, in order to, uh, or sac sacrificing freedom in order to get the security, because I believe that the best security is actually achieved in a de decentralized way. I mean, uh, we should f uh, uh, try to find solutions that do not rely on centralized control of the processes. I mean, the more you control the processes centrally uh, in the digital world, the more you risk that uh, this central control will itself be attacked and become a, a gate for the attacker to uh, to uh, violate uh, or to, to corrupt your systems. So I think at that point, the best, uh, the best, uh, both freedom and the security are being uh, achieved through decentralization. Thank you. Do, do you have something to add to the topic? No, but I, I guess, I mean, what is important is probably the aspect as well of, of education and awareness raising, right? So I guess um, giving giving people as well the skills at hand so that there might be maybe less of a real choice between these things, but to, to educate the people. And I think as well, again, right, I mean, what is hindering firms to, to become more digital or what is hindering municipalities to advance in digitalization. The number one reason we hear is, is that uh, they are lacking uh, the people with, with the right skills to, to advance in this direction. And I guess that would probably hold also even if we consider uh, consumers and the like. So I guess, yes, um, just, but otherwise, no. Thank you. We have here a few questions, so let's start with the first one. Why are the EU funds not targeted better at digitalization? What should improve? 
it should be known that actually the EU is not the ultimate or usual is not the ultimate uh, decision maker about how the EU funds are being used. I mean, most of the money, especially let's say from those cohesion funds that are being used in order to develop the less developed regions, are uh, being administrated in so-called like uh, shared management, which means that uh, the EU establishes a general framework. However, the actual practical implementation is very much relying on the civil servants uh, in the particular country. I mean, I have seen how it is being implemented in, let's say, by some regional governments in uh, in Czechia, and I don't have to. I, I have to admit that sometimes there was, uh, let's say, a lacking capacity to be really able to use those those money. I remember how, for example, the uh, recovery and resilience facility being was even like uh, managed by the Czech uh, Ministry of, uh, of of the Industry in the in the previous uh, election term, and mostly the very first idea they ha they came to was, well, let's repair all the bridges in the country because that's the way how we could spend all the money. But I mean, like maybe there are some bridges which are not broken. So this is not the way how to do that. And then if you talk to the to the people who are in the responsible um, administrative positions or the political positions, quite often they have very poor idea about what the ID or what the digital is. So hardly you can expect them to be really able to to uh, to use those money that are coming from from Europe. To, to the member states back uh, to use them in a proper way. Yes, and I mean, if I can add, we, we ask as well municipalities about, about their investment. And one of the questions in this municipality service as well, um, do you have a dedicated person in your municipality for, for digitalization going ahead? And very often the response is no. So I, I would say yes. I mean, the capacity building is probably of extreme importance to make these things work you need to have people in place that actually know what that would mean and what how, how to incorporate that and i think that's the same in, in in firms right if you have a person that is dedicated to getting digitalization on speed i guess the, the success of it is is much huger thank you the other question is coming back to the period of pandemic uh, COVID tells us that European households face extreme inequalities when it comes to access to internet or digital equipment. How can the EU tackle this issue? Mrs. Rueckert, if you want to start now for change. No, I, I think yes. I mean, that the pandemic has, has probably made these deficiencies very obvious, right? And I mean, even I'm from Germany, and I mean, if you've seen that there were a lot of schools that weren't equipped to, to give all their pupils enough uh, computers, um, I think that that's kind of a worrisome. And I guess um, I would hope at least that the pandemic in that respect led to some sort of wake up call and, see, and, and so that um, so that there will be more investments into that. Um, and I think, yes, I mean, we have seen it that, I mean, the moment you don't have an adequate internet, then the pandemic hit you even stronger. So I guess going forward, this is the, the, the digital infrastructure really, really needs to improve uh, in, a, in a lot of regions, yeah. Mr. Pixel? If I may elaborate on that, uh, that's very much true because uh, one cannot expect the European Union to really provide an internet connection to every single citizen because just if you look on the budget of the European Union, it's just something like 1% of the GDP of the European Union, which means it's quite small. So uh, the solution cannot be like uh, we built the infrastructure for you, but the solution could be a more like of uh, a consultative uh, car uh, consultative approach. I mean, like, I know uh, when we are talking about how the how the schools are being digitized, I know there is a small team currently working here in the uh, Minister of, uh, Ministry of Industry who are basically doing that way, uh, that thing that they are analyzing each of the schools here and providing them with the recommendation, well, this is the cheapest way how you can cover your school uh, you, uh, with the internet. Uh, you need this and that type of connection because we calculated the, the bandwidth you need uh, to, to achieve that, and this type of uh, uh, expertise, which is absolutely like crucial for for those schools to really like be able to provide or to deliver. And same time, I mean, like you cannot really like um, expect the the, the uh, director of normal like school to be an IT expert and to be capable to, to really like uh, ensure all this on the, all these technical decisions to, uh, on his own. So that's something that the EU could provide as well. 
Thank you. I guess we have time for one more question because we started late. So um, how do you see the challenge of adaption education curriculums to the fast pace of digitalization? Mrs. Rickard. Yeah, I mean, digital, I mean, skills in general, I think, are, are um, I mean, digital skills is one thing, but I guess, um, I think things like lifelong learning um, and, and making sure that um, that employees that uh, that are already a bit older as well are taken up on board, I think that's a huge effort. And it cannot just be, I guess, schools that now need to, 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 to shift the program. But I think as well, if you think about firms, they need to invest in the training of their current employees and, and make sure that, uh, that they are kept on board and that they, they will, um, because they will still need them. So I, I don't think it's, it's just a matter of changing the curriculum of, of school kids right now, but as well to make sure that there is some lifelong learning efforts and, and, and corporates, I think, need to pay, um, pay part of it as well. Yeah, I mean, this is probably another good question for a member of the European Parliament because the education is usually being uh, run on the uh, on the level of the member states or in some countries like Germany, even on the level of like uh, the, the Bundesländer. Uh, so uh, it's very much to, uh, uh, let's say, provide like recommendations. Should I provide general recommendation, I would say uh, we need to focus on the education much more. I mean, quite often you found there, find there uh, as, as you said, like uh, older people who are really uh, uh, not easily tackling uh, tackling the, 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 the challenges, but uh, then the, the question arises, okay, where are the younger? And you, have, you realize that uh, quite often the, the, the career in the education is not something for what the uh, younger people uh, decide. So I would say we should definitely generally make this, this uh, profession, I mean the teachers, to be more attractive, better paid and more interesting for younger people to, to join and to, to work there and not just run from, from the educational system to some uh, private sector where they pay more. It's a very important point in the end. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for being here, asking questions. Uh, thank you, our great speakers, having time for us and enjoy your day. Thank you. Thank you.